Okay, so um, we did another YouTube video where we talked about like the <clears throat> sort of the how, the why, if you will. I wound up with the third generation, so this is, happens to be a 2023 Suzuki Hayabusa. But I haven't really done anything to sort of talk about uh, my personal feelings about it, like a review, if you will, um, regarding the motorcycle. And I think there's a lot to say. So I figure what we'll do is we'll uh, take a quick ride, although it is getting to be, the sun is starting to set, and so it might get dark, uh, and really just kind of talk about um, the takeaway, uh, uh, my, my personal experience with the motorcycle. We'll get into some of the technical stuff. Uh, we got Heidi riding behind us. You can see her over my right shoulder. And um, we'll just go out on a, on a ride and, and get through this. So starting at the top, I think the easiest way to break this down is to sort of go really, really high level, if you will, and talk about pros and cons. So getting into the pros, um, there, there are a lot of them, but the, the ones that immediately come to mind for me uh, personally, as the individual riding the bike, <clears throat> would be uh, the bike is very comfortable, uh, despite its weight, and we'll get into that, which I think is a con. Uh, the bike is incredibly comfortable. There was a conversation about uh, whether or not um, like a different seat would be something that would be useful. Uh, we were looking at Louis Moto for uh, aftermarket seats, and they've got their gold gel um, material, and so the idea was well. If we're going to put in the order for one, let's just go ahead and do them all at the same time uh, for the CBR, the ZH2, and the Hayabusa. But the thing is, I don't think the Hayabusa needs it. I have gone um, hundreds of miles in a go on, on the Hayabusa. I've done 500 miles in the last couple of weeks, and uh, no soreness at all. No butt soreness, no fatigue um, of any kind related to the seat. So, uh... I guess just getting into that, the bike is incredibly, incredibly comfortable. Uh, the next thing that I would consider a pro for this bike is everything that they've thrown at it, like it, like everything in the kitchen sink. And we'll get into that when we talk about like the value of the motorcycle, I guess. But uh, Suzuki threw everything in the kitchen sink at this motorcycle, and maybe some would consider that to be too much. But for this bike. Uh, it's a big bike. Uh, it it handles it. You know, every everything that it has, I don't think, is more than what it needs. It's not some excess. Maybe a little gimmicky. Maybe, uh, depending on your scenario, your riding circumstances. But uh, everything that's that's here plays well to this bike. And the last thing that I would say, high level, that I would put into the the pro category, is the power delivery of this motorcycle. Um, I talked about how it was comfortable, and the power delivery is part of that as well. Not just the physical riding ergonomics, but the the actual sort of the power delivery, the way that it, it builds and delivers that power as you go through the rev range. Um, the, the best way that I have to describe this is, um, and, I, and I've said this, and I think I, I borrowed it from somebody else, is that riding this thing is like riding a lazy boy. It is this big, powerful bike, but everything about it um, is just smooth and collected and put together. So when we talk about pros, we also have cons to talk about. And uh, one of the major cons that, it, that stands out for Hayabusa is the elephant in the room. The thing is heavy. It weighs a lot. Uh, the bike, I, I want to say the curb weight on the thing is 582 pounds. And there's some stuff that you can do about that. And as it's as it's being ridden, it carries its weight really well. But I found that despite the fact that it does carry its weight really well, in a situation where I'm riding, um, uh, I don't want to say a smaller bike, but maybe a, a lighter bike, I, I found more confidence and, and a sense of more nimbleness uh, to these other bikes that um, the Hayabusa just doesn't have. It's not bad, it's just it is heavy and there isn't any way around that. So, the uh, next thing that it would be considered a con, and some might actually see this as a, like, a pro, it depends what you're looking for, but for me personally, 
I would consider the culture surrounding the Hayabusa or anything from Suzuki's GSXR line to be a little bit of a con. Some, I, I actually, we were at a Chinese restaurant and I had a server come up to me who had no, he didn't know anything about motorcycles at all. And he's like, hey, um, are those your motorcycles out there? Yeah, we had our helmet sitting on the table. And he's like, oh, like, uh, some of the guys in the back were, you know, talking about it. And they were, and they said that Jixers are bad. Like, what's bad about a Jixer? I was like, uh, nothing's bad about a Jixer necessarily. It's just sort of, uh, a Jixer has a stereotypical, um, sort of rider that goes along with it. And in that sense, I, I do get a little bit of that um, that comes with me in riding the Hayabusa. So, eh, like, it depends on what you're looking for, what kind of attention it is that you want. Um, maybe the culture that surrounds the, the Hayabusa is bad. But, but in other ways, maybe it's good. Um, and the last thing that I've got on my con list that, that I've personally encountered is how it stands up against any of the other leader bikes, if you will. Like, when we look at the heritage of the Hayabusa, it is the fastest thing around. And honestly, when you're comparing it to... There isn't a whole lot else to compare it to right now. Um, but when you're comparing it to the other bikes that show up, the big power makers that are in the... Um, you know, in your group ride, the Hayabusa is the slowest thing there. Uh, and that's okay. Um... Like, it's not, like, I hate to say this, it's not a dick measuring contest, but, but maybe it is. And in that regard, um, you're, you're definitely not going to win. Uh, the leader bikes nowadays are putting out more horsepower. They weigh significantly less. The CBR that you see, uh, again, over my right shoulder, uh, that Heidi's riding on right now, um, Honda actually makes a little less horsepower than some of the other guys in there, but it weighs a lot less too. That bike is... Uh, over a hundred pounds lighter than the Hayabusa and makes the same amount of power. Um, the ZX-10 that I was on uh, just a couple of years ago, which was still the most recent generation of the ZX-10, um, that bike made, what, 200 horsepower and weighed, ab again, about a hundred pounds less than the Hayabusa. So, and they're gearing, they're tuning. Uh, they're way more frantic of a bike. Um, and if that's what you're looking for, it's tough to recommend a Hayabusa to someone and go, hey, like, here's this this big, chonkin', powerful bike that's just sort of big and chonkin' because it is powerful, but everything's faster than you um, in your group ride. So, there's that. Um, so, stepping away from the pros and cons and moving into individual components, um, let's get into what is the bike like to ride? And as I said, it, it is very much a lazy boy. Um, it's ultra, ultra comfortable. You can... Uh, do everything, I think, like, you can do everything except for, like, off-roading with this bike. You can put down big miles. You can take it to a drag strip. You can take it to a track. You can take it out on, you know, the highway and do your highway pulls and be safe, but do your highway pulls. You can, you know, again, there are things that are going to be more agile than it, but you can definitely get out to the canyons and do some canyon carving. Um, the bike does everything fairly well, except for off-road. It does everything fairly well. It's not the the perfect tool for any particular category. As said, there are lots of things that are faster than it. There's lots of things that are more nimble than it. There are lots of things that are more, excuse me, comfortable than it. There um, are, are better solutions for uh, long-distance touring, but it will do all of those things fairly well. Um, as far as the economy, uh, it's a 5.3 gallon gas tank, and I average between Phillips about 190 miles. I don't, I never actually let it get empty, so I'm not sure. I haven't stretched it to the to the max, but I get about 190 miles, uh, which breaking down that 190 miles over 5.3 gallons comes out to about 36 miles per gallon. And I'm not like pegging the rev limiter everywhere that I go, but I'm also like ever since COVID, I, I've sort of uh, taking on this new term, and that's a COVID speed limit. And the COVID speed limit is about 70 to 80 miles an hour everywhere that I happen to ride. So doing between, we'll just say 70. 70 miles an hour um, from point A to point B, 36 miles a gallon is really decent. So there's that. What it's like to ride, it's got every amenity that you could possibly 
um, want for what this bike is without within realistic expectations. It's ultra comfortable. You get decent range. Um, yeah, that, that's what I would say about it. Um, but looking at the history of like what is the Hayabusa, like where did the Hayabusa come from? If if you're looking at this, chances are you already know most of this. But for those of you that are the uninitiated or uninformed about the Hayabusa, uh, the Hayabusa came out in uh, 1999. It was it was Suzuki's response to Honda's uh, CBR 1100 uh, Super Blackbird, which um, at the time we were looking at the speed wars that were coming out of the big. Uh, I, I don't know who all this encompassed, but uh, for sure the big four were, were getting up to some shenanigans. When we say the big four, we're talking about the Jam Japanese manufacturers being Kawasaki, Suzuki, uh, Honda, and Yamaha. And so uh, as things just continue to get crazy, there, there's a, there was something that was uh, formed called the Gentleman's Agreement. We'll talk about that in a second. And uh, there's a Gentleman's Agreement for motorcycles and cars alike for the same reason. It essentially said, hey, now might be a good time to self-govern before government actually comes, like the actual government, federal government comes in and sets regulations because y'all are crazy. And so essentially what happened was um, the gentleman's agreement said, hey, motorcycles are getting nuts. The Super Blackbird, um, Honda's thing that, that the Hayabusa, you know, was, was created to compete against, uh, Honda did 177 miles an hour. And so... Suzuki was like, hey, let's <laughs> let's throw that in their face and uh, make a motorcycle called the Hayabusa, which in Japanese uh, translates to the Peregrine Falcon, which is a bird known to hunt blackbirds. And so let's make that, and ours will do 194 miles an hour. So we're looking at like another 15 miles an hour over that, which 15 miles an hour, not that big of a deal, but we're, we're just about 200 miles an hour on a death machine now. And and so they were like, all right, we gotta have this gentleman's agreement. No motorcycle that we make, everything is gonna be restricted to 186 miles an hour. And so the first generation of the Hayabusa ran from 1999 to 2007. Um, it went fully into effect. The gentleman's agreement went fully into effect from 2001 um, for, for the models. And so uh, very early into the first generation, uh, the Hayabusa's were limited to 186 miles an hour. Uh, then we had our second generation, which was uh, 2008 to 2020, and that's kind of where the Hayabusa ended for a little while. Emissions uh, are getting more and more strict. Um, regulations become more and more strict for fuel economy, emissions ratings, uh, sound, and the Hayabusa just kind of was, was a dinosaur in its way. And I don't want to say a dinosaur. Maybe let's call it like a a great white shark, something that didn't need to evolve until suddenly the environment that it existed in had a drastic change. And so something had to happen or it dies off. And something did happen. They made another one. Um, starting in, it was announced in 2021, it was about February 5th, I believe, uh, they announced the third generation Hayabusa, which released for the 2022 uh, year. And again, this one just happens to be a, a 2023. Um, so now we have our third generation Hayabusa. They are down on power um, by a, a couple of horsepower from the prior generations. But the way that Suzuki set it up, they set it and said, hey, ride it and tell us you can actually feel by the seat of your pants. Tell us that you can feel that it's down in power. In fact, we bet you that it feels faster, stock for stock. And um, Nobody, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has gotten on a third gen and gone, ugh, this is so much aw more awful, this is slower, this is worse. A everyone gets on it and goes, ah, this is more refined, it's just as quick. Uh, because it is. It is a monster in the way that it builds and delivers that power. Again, um, the frantic craziness of any modern leader bike from the Big Four, uh, like on actual numbers, you know, will outrun this for a while. And uh, and that's okay, but but the Hayabusa is it is still a massive force to be reckoned with. And so when we talk about the power, let's get into the engine. What what are we looking at when we're comparing it to a leader bike? Actually, Heidi just asked me a little bit ago. She's like, so is the Hayabusa? Is Hi Heidi's not super technically informed. She's ridden a handful of things, but she's not super technically informed. 
on motorcycle. She's like, so is a Hayabusa not considered a leader bike? I was like, no, no, no. So a leader bike is defined as leader, like a unit of measurement. Uh, quartz, cups, liters. Um, and one liter is 1,000 cc's. So when we're looking at a leader bike, we're talking about the 1,000 cc bikes. And again, looking at the big four, we got the Jixxer 1000, we got the ZX10, we got the Yamaha R1, um, we've got the CBR 1000 R, which is what she's uh, riding. And uh, so no, the Hayabusa is not a leader bike. Uh, it actually has 1,340 cc's. Um, uh, and then so the engine is a is a 1,300 cc bike. Uh, puts out 187 horsepower, 110 pound feet of torque. Um, and yeah, but again, which is great numbers. Those are great, excellent numbers. It's excellent numbers for torque. Uh, especially considering that the thing makes torque um, very early on compared to the way that a leader bike delivers its power. you got to be all the way up at the top of the rev range for most of them to get peak performance out of it. Um, so this does a phenomenal job. It is ride-by-wire. And so we're going to get into the features uh, later on when we talk about value. But the ride-by-wire, what does that mean for this bike? Uh, just like any of the flagships that are coming out of the big four now, um, we've got a uh, quick shifter up and down. Um, this bike happens to have two different modes for its quick shifter, which is kind of interesting. And so we've got our quick shifter up and down, and then we've got um, cruise control. Uh, the ZX-10 has cruise control. I, the CBR does not. I don't know if the Yamaha does, um, and I'm not sure if the Jixxer 1000 does or not. I think it does. I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, so this has cruise control, another one of those long, big mile sort of situations. We're going to have to stop here for just a second, I think, because uh, Heidi's asked that we pull over for a minute. You'll notice that we've started collecting a lot of bugs. Um, let's go ahead and pull over and see what is going on with Heidi, and then we'll go ahead and pick back up here in just a minute. mosquitoes, you can see them swarming my bike. Well, it's too. They're just going after the heat. Alright, let's turn around and head back. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Oh, man. But you're moving? No. He didn't just clean the bike either. Oh, look at my wind. Look at my light. Uh, well, I mean, I guess I'll just wash your bike again for the video, right? Yeah. Alright. Let's get out of here before we get eaten. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and hit the road again. Uh, that's exactly what it is. Uh, Heidi's taking a ton of mosquitoes to the chest. Uh, she's just kind of wearing a dress and a, a sweater over top. Obviously, we're not doing so good on that at-gat thing, wearing the gear. So 
Um, yeah, definitely don't do what we're doing. Wear your gear all the time. So um, let's go ahead and continue back where we were. Uh, we talked about the engine. Um, big engine, puts out uh, decent numbers, delivers the power, super smooth, uh, ride by wire, so, uh, which just means that there's no, excuse me, actual physical throttle cable. It's electronic um, between the, the throttle here on the right hand and uh, opening up the valves and, and, and essentially power. It's electronic, it's all handled by the computer, um, which allows for amenities such as uh, up and down quick shifter and that cruise control. Um, let's get into the suspension. Suspension is definitely not my forte. It's not something that I have a tremendous level of expertise in talking about. Um, but what I can say is, and this kind of goes back to the, the bike being comfortable, it does an excellent, excellent job at soaking up the bumps and the, the imperfections of the road. It does a phenomenal job. For those of you that want the white paper information, it's KYB, front and rear, fully adjustable, both front and rear. Uh, beyond that, couldn't tell you a whole lot about it. I don't know um, a whole lot. It's just, it's extremely comfortable. I have not done any modifications to the suspension. I may be able to get a little more out of it for different riding situations, uh, be it, you know, more aggressive riding or something more comfortable by dialing in based on my physical dimensions, my weight, what it is that I'm looking for. And so, um, if you're going to be riding a bike long term, maybe that's something that you look into, is um, going ahead and uh, taking your motorcycle to somewhere that will do a sus suspension adjustment based on your personal bodily physical characteristics. Uh, next up, brakes. The brakes work. Like, that's what I can say about it. Same thing. Uh, the front is the Brembo Stylema uh, front. It's a dual disc, four piston. Um, calipers, and then the rears, uh, the Nissan rear single piston, single disc. Um, not a whole lot to talk about these, other than something that is kind of interesting, is that um, the brakes are linked for the front and rear for the Hayabusa, uh, and there is no way that I have discovered to turn that off. So when you apply uh, braking force with just your brake lever, not using your foot brake, but just your brake lever, I believe that the ratio is 75% of the braking force goes to the front, 30 goes to the rear at all times. You can definitely change that by using uh, the, and when I say you can change that, I mean you can change the, the behavior, not a setting. Uh, you can definitely use your front brake and your rear brake um, in conjunction manually with your body by using your foot and your hand at the same time. And on the dash, there's actually this little gauge that shows you uh, what percentage of uh, braking force that you are using for both front and rear. It also shows you your throttle, how, what position it's in as a percentage as well. So there's that. Um, transmission. Not a whole lot to talk about here either. It's a six-speed transmission, uh, one down, five up. Um, there is something that's kind of interesting about it. I, I don't, again, transmissions are not something that I am incredibly versed in, but um, six-speed but the, I want to say it's the fourth through sixth, or maybe it's the fifth and sixth gears, actually have oil squirters on them. I don't know if it's for smoothness or temperature or what it is, but they just happen to have it. Now we can talk about appearance. Appearance is incredibly subjective. I will say that when I looked at the bike, when I was debating on whether or not to get this motorcycle, I would say that it was incredibly ugly. I just was not a fan of them. Uh, I happen to get the white and blue. It's a pearl white and a sparkle blue. I'm not 100% sure what the exact colors are. There's a uh, like a dark silver and red one. There's a black and bronze one. There's a black and chrome one. Um, so it's like black and black with some chrome. All of them have like that little bit of that uh, swoosh sort of chrome on the side fairing. But uh, I got the white and blue one. It was the best looking one in my opinion, between them. Uh, the black and orange was okay, but I don't think they made it for the 2023. I think that was 2022 year model. And um, after I got it, I will say it grew on me significantly. So now when I look at it, I actually enjoy the look of it. It's big, it's bulky. There's a lot of plastic real estate going on, but um, it's not for everyone. The, the way that these bikes look is uh, a result of 
wind tunnel testing. They essentially said, hey, let's put a motorcycle-shape-esque sort of something in a wind tunnel and um, see what works best in a wind tunnel. And out came a Hayabusa-looking motorcycle. So that's why the Hayabusa looks like what it does. Um, cool factor. Uh, like Again, very, very subjective. But what I will say is that when I was on the ZH2, very few people recognized it for what it was. In fact, I have a cargo container on there, a top case and a uh, cup holder, and so I turned it sort of into a touring bike. But when I would go places, people would be like, oh, how do you keep up with Heidi with her CBR? And it's like, it's a ZH2. It's in many ways faster than the CBR, but they didn't, they, they just kind of saw this generic motorcycle. And a lot of people look at motorcycles and go, oh, it's a ninja. You know, any, any sport bike that is a crotch rocket or a ninja or whatever. People look at this, they see the kanji on the side, and they go, oh, that's a Hayabusa. Even non-motorcycle people know what this is. And so, uh, take it or leave it, depending on what your preferences are. I would say the fact that it's recognized everywhere, kind of cool factor. Uh, the other thing is, these things are heavily, heavily modified. We're very early into the third gen, so there's not a whole lot to see. There's the Hyperbusa and the Superbusa, which are turbocharged and supercharged application. Um, you know, modifications I've seen uh, boring out so for larger displacement. But for the prior generation of the Hayabusas, I want to say the top, the record for one, was a top speed of over 270 miles an hour with a 700 horsepower turbocharged Hayabusa. That's nuts. Like, the fact that you can do that with these bikes is crazy. Um, I want to say the actual uh, record record is, is 300 and 12 miles per hour on a Hayabusa. However, the engines are used in so many other things that have set stupid numbers and stupid applications. Some of them not even remotely practical. Like the Hayabusa engine in the smart car. I think it was called like a smart Busa or something. And the thing just does donuts. You you floor it and it just spins in place. Not not a burnout. It literally does little 360 donuts in place. It's it's crazy. Um Rushing through it, because we're going to end this right here in just a second. It's getting dark and there's bugs everywhere. Value. And that depends on what you're after. What is it that you're looking for? Because this bike does everything fairly well, except for off-road. I'm going to keep reiterating. Please don't take a Hayabusa off-road. It's heavy and it's it's just not manageable. You have a mistake. You have to put your leg down and you're going to have a broken ankle or something. It does everything but off-road fairly well. Um, at $18,000... Maybe you want something that is very specialized to what you want. If you're looking for a jack of all trades, sure, get the Hayabusa. If you can manage the the weight, the Hayabusa is great. Um, and when we talk about like earlier, I said they threw everything in the kitchen sink for eighteen thousand dollars for a bike that uh, has this level of performance. It also has ten stage traction control, ten stage wheelie control, three different power modes. Three of them are set. Three of them are programmable. Uh, it has a up and down quick shifter. And that quick shifter, again, has multiple modes. It has a comfort mode and a performance mode. It has three levels of engine braking. It has three-stage launch control, which, by the way, I'm terrified to even use. Um, it has cornering ABS. It has cruise control. It has an active speed limiter, which means you can set a speed and limit it that speed so that it's essentially like valet mode. Um, it has hill hold control. It has slope descent control. So it has everything. I would say great value. If you're looking for this, get it.